Welcome everybody to uh, this public lecture. I will be chairing today's session. My name is Ruth Hall. I'm a professor at, uh, at PLAS at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies. Um, and uh, PLAS is very happy to be hosting this. We are an institute at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa, for those who don't know. And today's special public lecture is co-hosted um, by the Network of Excellence on Land Governance in Africa, that is NELGA. Uh, we are a partner of NELGA, an alliance of universities across the African continent who are working with the UN Economic Commission for, for Africa, with uh, also the African Union and African Development Ban Bank, and supported by GIZ. And we are, as plus, a special node of this uh, NELGA network. And this lecture is also supported by the South African Research Chairs Initiative of the Department of Science and Innovation and the National Research Foundation in South Africa, um, who support my chair. I would like to start by way of introducing our speaker. And before reading her bio, I wanted to say a few words just about the significance of Bina's work over many decades. Uh, some of us became acquainted with questions and debates around women's rights, particularly through the publication of Bina's key work, A Field of One's Own. This was a book in the 1990s that really marked a critical moment in the shift from the women in development to the gender in development paradigm in thinking. And this was a shift beyond including women in development towards a focus on changing ownership and control of assets, uh, and therefore a relational change, change in gender, gender relations. And also a shift away from looking at women as a homogen homogenous group towards differentiating women. And as a footnote, I must say that Bina's work impacted so, so profoundly on me that I sought her out and I was very lucky to be able to spend a bit of time conducting research with Bina in support of her projects, um, but that was 25 years ago. <laughs> Uh, we're, of course, in a different era now, perhaps from the era in which, uh, Bina, your work first gained really global attention. This is an era now where most countries have national laws that recognize women's land rights. Uh, we have regional frameworks. In Africa, we have an African land agenda uh, and a framework and guidelines on land governance uh, that do prioritize women's rights to land and gender equality in land. Uh, and I want to recognize the work of particularly Dr. Joan Kagwanja, uh, the chief of the African Land Policy Center at UNECA, who has driven a lot of this work and who has part of our network. Globally, we have the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure. We have the SDGs. So in many ways, women's land rights have become incorporated into legal thinking, into uh, development planning and programming, in a way that in which gender equality is recognized as being part of the development of the definition of development itself. But there are huge disciplinary and political and ideological divides, particularly in contexts where there are forms of customary tenure and governance of institutions uh, and where market based approaches uh, to property rights continue to be contentious. Having said all of that, uh, we are really thrilled as PLAS and as NELGA and with the support of the Saatchi program to be welcoming you, Bina. Uh, Professor Bina Agarwal, I will now introduce is Professor of Development Economics and also Environment at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Um, before that, she was Director and Professor of Economics at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. She has been president of the International Society for Ecological Economics and president of the International Association for Feminist Econom Economics. And I must say that it's in her role within IAFI, the International Association for Feminist Econ Economics, that she will be visiting uh, South Africa next month. Uh, and some of us will be meeting up um, with her in Cape Town. So those of you part of that conversation, uh, we will discuss further how to do that. She's also been um, served on various advisory uh, bodies at the national level in India, but also in UN agencies. And she's held visiting positions at the universities of Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, Princeton Minnesota, and Michigan. Uh, Bina has published over 100 academic papers, 16 books on various aspects of property rights, land rights, and gender. Uh, environment and development, bargaining and gender relations, food security, poverty and law. And I think that a long-standing interest also has been in um, joint forest management. 
I recall. Um, but all of this is from a political economy and gender perspective, uh, both at a theoretical level and with uh, a focus on field experience. Her path-breaking work, really, as I've said, has been uh, anchored in her work on women's land rights and her pioneering book, A Field of One's Own, which was a 1994 publication. And this was really part of placing the issue of women's land rights centrally on the agenda of governments, NGOs, and international agencies. Um, and of course, women's land rights now is, is right there in SDG 5, but is it there on the ground? Uh, that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, there are many more things that I can say about uh, Bina, but very generally, I'd like to just um, acknowledge that we're, we're very happy to have you, Bina. You've, uh, you've had an enormous impact with your work, um, and, uh, and you're actually, as I understand it, presenting to us today a very broad review that goes from the questions about rights in law to rights in practice, experiences across different regions, but with a focus on India, and drawing out lessons also for not only uh, joint land holding, but also collective forms of land use and production. Uh, so with that, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Those of you who um, are on social media throughout the next uh, 45 minutes for Bina's lecture, you're very welcome to tweet. In fact, we would love it if you would tweet. If you do so, please use the hashtag women's land, no apostrophe, just women's land. Uh, so as to be able to uh, pick up on the conversation. And uh, we will have ample time. This is a slightly longer format today uh, than our normal seminars. This is a public lecture, so we'll be here for one and a half hours. Um, and there'll be ample time for you to engage in conversation and Q&A with, with Bina afterwards. So with that, thank you very much, Bina, and over to you. Ruth. Um... <clears throat> Thank you for organizing this talk and for this very generous introduction. Um, and I, uh, I also thank um, uh, Farai um, for his uh, logistical support. You know, as Ruth said, I first met uh, Ruth in 1998, nine, when she first came to Delhi as a young, insightful, enthusiastic academic. And here she is now a renowned professor. Uh, and I, um, it's it's totally amazing to reconnect uh, both with Ruth and with many others um, in South Africa and those who've joined the talk today, old friends and hopefully new ones. Um, so let me uh, let me start with my um, screen. Okay. Uh, you can all see the screen. Yes. So Ruth, you can nod if you can. I we can to, see it if you can uh, just put it out yeah, to screen. It yes. So, you know, I, I first um, visited South Africa in 1997 uh, at the invitation of the Center for um, Legal Studies at Stellenbosch. Um, that was about three years after my book, A Field of One's Own, was published. And I remember it was a huge conf three-day conference. I gave two keynotes. And it was attended by something like 60 to 70 NGOs uh, working, on, uh, working on land from South Africa, also Zimbabwe. And it was really a high, um, it's a political high point in South Africa. There was a huge interest in land reform, uh, among other things. Um, I also went to Durban, to Johannesburg, to Pretoria, and to Peter Maritzburg. And it was really a very emotional trip because, as you know, there's been such longstanding connections between. India and South Africa, historically, the Gandhian connection, the Indian National Congress, and so on. Now, I um, there was an episode linked to my trip uh, in Peter Maritzburg um, that I want to share with you. So in November 1997, at the invitation of the Association for Advancement, um, Rural Advancement, which is AFRA, as you can see the symbol, um, I visited a land occupation and resettlement site in the Cramon area. And I was accompanied by this wonderful uh, grassroots activist from Afra, Sizani Gobani. Um, I was very sorry to see that she had um, passed away in 2020. Um, <clears throat> and now this site uh, that we visited together was occupied mostly by women and children who were doing vegetable and poultry farming, while most of the men were away in other jobs. So during my discussion with some 25 to 30 women, I remember it was pouring with rain outside. We were sitting in this little room. 
I asked the women, um, in whose names will these plots be registered? So they said their husbands and after which their older sons uh, will inherit the land under the customary practice of primogenitor. So then I asked them, but shouldn't the land be in your name since you're the ones who are farming it? And I was greeted with silence. So I repeated the question. Um, it was being translated by Sizani and this caused a buzz. So finally, one woman said, we are taking so long to answer your question because no one has ever asked us this before. So it seems like a dream that we might have land of our own. So this was a very moving moment. And I later, you know, I wrote about this in a 2003 paper. And this is called, we tend to call it adaptive preferences, which is when the disadvantaged fail to ask for something that they cannot even dream of possessing or getting. The women's response also surprised Sizani, who then sought to make women's land claims integral to Afra's approach. Now that was 1997. Um, and since then, of course, land rights, as Ruth has elaborated, become an inherent demand in South Africa and globally. But how many South African women own land today? That is a key question, and we'll return to that. In fact, um, women's struggle for land has been longstanding um, globally. So in South Asia, since I wrote uh, A Field of One's Own, things have moved forward and they've stayed the same. And I'll focus first on India's experience and some potential solutions. And we can then discuss to what extent that experience has something to offer South Africa. Now in India, almost a century has passed since we first raised the demands for equal rights in property, especially land. So in the 1930s, as you can see from these pictures, there were a large number of, uh, a, not a large number, but several important national women's organizations, um, uh, you know, raised uh, the issue of property as a key demand. Uh, it was undivided India and it was still under British colonial rule. And this demand was partly for its own sake and partly because the right to vote um, and to stand for elections was linked to owning property. Now, this demand was supported by liberal male legislators, uh, and these efforts bore some fruit. Firstly, uh, initially in 1937, both for Hindu and Muslim women, and later mainly for Hindu women, with the drafting of what was called the Hindu Code Bill in 1942, which, among other things, um, sought to enhance the daughter's rights, inheritance rights. Now, the bill uh, was subject to... Um, heated debate um, and, uh, and, and um, as you can imagine, uh, when it was first introduced in the Constituent Assembly of uh, Independent India in 1948. And of the 392 members of the Constitution Drafting Committee, only 15 were women, as you can see from this picture here, um, there are one or two absent, um, which is a small number, but they were vocal. And many male legislators opposed the bill. So for example, uh, if, during various constituent assembly and parliamentary debates in the late 1940s and early 1950s, one legislator asked, are you going to enact a code which will facilitate the breaking up of our households? Another said, if daughters inherited property, then they would choose not to marry at all. And he cried, may God save us from an army of unmarried women. It was rather ironic uh, because it suggested that the moment women became independent with property, they would, um, uh, they would simply leave the marriage. So it really underlined the inequality, uh, underlying inequality. Now, of course, cartoonists had a field day um, playing this up. And there are two cartoons from 1948-49 um, where uh, they took uh, their extreme claims uh, of men being tied up and women demanding their rights. And this is Ambedkar, and this is a villager who's responding to that. Now, in the end, uh, the uh, following delays and compromises, the progressive prevailed, especially uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who was a major figure in the drafting of India's constitution, and Pandit Joharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. And in the end, um, the Hindu Code Bill was finally enacted in four separate acts, with inheritance being governed by the Hindu Succession Act of 1956. 
Now, although still gender unequal, this act shifted women's property rights from a position of gross inequality to a fair degree of equality um, for some 83% of Indian women, which are Hindu women and also Sikhs, Jains, and um, Buddhists. So what was the shift? To answer this question, uh, we need to first keep in mind that India's inheritance system um, are, they are plural and they're very complex. So they vary not only by religion, but by region and type of property. So as you can see here, there are different laws for Hindus, for Muslims, for Parsis, for Christians, um, and, um, and also tribal, uh, tribal communities. And agricultural land is treated differently from other types of property. So what this actually means is um, uh, that, uh, and, and region matters. So you can be a Hindu in Northwest India after the 56 Act, and you would be, have, be subject to different inheritance um, uh, laws um, or, or rules um, uh, in, in, in the Northwest compared to say the South. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to why that is the case. Now, um, post in, so, so this, was, uh, this was the plural system, which one has to keep in mind. Now, there is some peculiarities about Hindu law, and I'll particularly talk about Hindu law because that applies to most, uh, uh, most uh, part of the population. Now, it had two major inequalities. To understand what those inequalities are, we have to understand uh, the complexity of this law, which distinguishes between uh, separate property, which is self-acquired property, and joint family property, which would be ancestral property, and it's held as co partnery shares. Now, what this means is that those born into the family, um, uh, they uh, acquire rights by birth, and these can't be willed away. Now, prior to the 1956 Act, most Hindus fell under the purview of the 11th, 12th century Mitakshra system. And under this system, the vast majority of Hindu women could only inherit their father's or their husband's property in the absence of four generations of agnatic males. Only after them came the widow, then the unmarried daughter, and then the married daughter. So the 56 Act was a major advance in that sense that it gave widows and daughters equal shares with sons or brothers in a man's separate property interstate if he didn't write a will, and there was absolute right to will, and his share in joint family property. Um, now, this, uh, this improvement, however, despite this improvement, there are two inequalities which remained. First, daughters had no direct birth rights in joint family property. And secondly, agricultural land was subject to state level tenurial laws which were highly gender unequal, especially in the Northwest. And, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the 50s, soon after um, independence, land reform laws were passed and um, each state had its own land reform laws. Agriculture was a state subject. And within those land tenurial laws, some of these um, uh, land reform laws actually specified an order of inheritance, which dated back to the 11th, 12th century rules. And, um, Subsequent to that, between 1976 and 1994, the uh, HSA 56 was amended in five states. Kerala abolished joint family property altogether, and four states included unmarried daughters as co partners in joint family property. But they didn't touch the issue of agricultural land. It is notable, those of you who know the geography of India, that all these states are in south and one is in the west. And this is important to remember. The next major change for all India was the 2005 Hindu Succession Act, which was amended. And I led this uh, civil society campaign for the amendment of this, um, of this uh, act. Uh, I had taught myself so much of law when I was writing a field of one's own <clears throat> that it served a very uh, useful purpose um, in this um, context. Now, it was transformative uh, for, on four counts in particular. Firstly, it gave daughters the same birth rights as sons, uh, both married and unmarried daughters. And this land could not be, if it was land or whatever property, could not be willed away. 
It also gave daughters equal rights in agricultural land because the discriminatory clause in agricultural land was removed. It allowed married daughters to return and reside in the parental home and to ask for partition if they needed to, and to also become managers of joint family property. So this was a big deal. And especially if you think of women facing domestic violence, it gave them a legal right to return to their parental home. And the, and the important thing was these were not state level amendments. They applied and overrode um, all, all, all other laws across states. What is notable, of course, is something a point I'll come to, is that by increasing the daughter's share, they decreased the widow's uh, share. In fact, all legal amendments since India's independence have increased the shares of daughters, but decreased the shares of widows. And I think this is something that I want to highlight that when we, we are now, when we talk about advocating equality in law with men, we seldom factor in the possible inequalities which can be created between women. And this is, this is true even um, in, in women's movements. Nevertheless, we can see that there's, the law has progressed. And then, of course, the key question is, what about practice? Now, before I address this question, I also want to share with you that the empirical evidence um, on why it is important for women to have rights in land has expanded globally, and it's expanded substantially since a field of one's own um, was uh, published. Now, as you may recall, or maybe you haven't dipped into the book, um, but uh, a field of one's own covered five countries, and I had argued that women needed um, rights in their own names and control over the land, command over property. And it also traced the gender gaps in legal rights historically and examined why we see a gap between law and practice. But in making the case, I had uh, made four distinctions uh, for women's land rights. Um, that is in terms of welfare, efficiency, equality, and empowerment. And that, that frame, framing I found was useful because others have since used it. Now, um, the empirical evidence, if you, if you look at it from these four aspects, um, has, has grown uh, globally. So what is empirical evidence? In particular, what you find is that the positive effects of women owning land, um, uh, the welfare effects are particularly on the impact of the mother owning land uh, on or uh, assets on child nutrition, education, and health relative to only the father owning land. And this is true for many countries. And I've written and I've, you know, cited a number of um, uh, studies on that count. A second uh, impact, um, and this is something relating to work that I've done subsequent to uh, the book, was that um, owning immovable property hugely reduced the risk of domestic violence. It was work I did with a colleague, and I want to show you this one slide, which shows you how dramatic the difference was. Um, we looked at 502 um, uh, randomly selected rural and urban households, and women who were, prop this is Kerala, the, the women-friendly state where women are highly educated and so on. Women who owned no immovable property, neither house nor land, they experienced, 49% of them experienced domestic, physical domestic violence. Those who owned both, only 7% did. And there was in between 18% and 10% if they owned a house or land. And then we controlled in the, this paper, I believe it was one of the first paper of its kind, we controlled for everything else uh, in regressions and we found these were the prop, own, owning a movable property was extremely important. In addition to the welfare effects, we also see a literature which has grown on the efficiency effects. These effects are particularly important for policymakers because they'll say, yes, if we give, if we give women land, um, what impact will it have on productivity? Um, and what, uh, again, you have uh, positive news. The FAO in 2011 produced a state of the farmer report, which was focused on women and land. And it culled together all the studies that had been done on this, most of them were from sub-Saharan Africa because of the uh, availability of data. And um, it, uh, it showed uh, that if um, women had, um, you know, if, uh, if we reduce the gender gap between men and women in access to land and other inputs, it would increase um, yields on women's plots by 20 to 30 percent 
and um, the agricultural growth of countries from anything from 2.4 to 4%. In addition, there have been a, a range of uh, individual studies, which many of you have been maybe familiar with, some of which show that women have uh, lower productivity on their land compared to men, some show they have the same and some less. Um, and the reasons for um, the uh, less are typically that they have less access to their disadvantage structurally in other inputs apart from land. And then there have been, there've been studies on empowerment effects, which are particularly focused on intra-household decision-making, uh, women's mobility, and sense of self-worth. And then, of course, there's equality, uh, which is intrinsic worth, which would be the human rights argument and other arguments for, for women having land rights. But these studies, there are rather few studies which collect the kind of data which would enable this research. And it is also notable that if you look at the FAO's database on gender gap in land, you only have 20 countries, and most of these are from sub-Saharan Africa, very few from Asia. So um, I will now um, uh, give, share with you um, a very recent work um, on India. India has had uh, India collects agricultural data from the agricultural census, the National Sample Survey. And it collects gender-wise data on operational holdings, but not on ownership. You can imagine the frustration one might feel that how would it matter if they just put in that additional um, question uh, in a census? But we don't have it, um, despite uh, intensive lobbying by many of us. Then there are institutions which collect survey data, which uh, NCAR, some of you know this work, IHDS and the uh, NFHS, but these have uh, various kinds of limitations. Um, in uh, looking uh, like a detective searching for data, I recently then, a few years ago, came across the ICRISAD database, um, which had collected uh, gender-owned uh, information. Um, and I'll tell you about this uh, in a minute. Um, this is, ICRISAT has also done uh, surveys in, in Africa and Chris Udre and other work have drawn on it. But uh, in the Indian context, um, ours was the first time where we looked at the, the gender of the owner um, uh, and um, in, in these two recent papers. Now it's not perfect, it covers much more, but it covers much more than other sources. And it's, it's longitudinal for the period of time 2009 to 2014. I might mention for those of you who work with data that collecting accurate data needs an understanding of the laws and hence the potential sources of land when designing surveys. And so there is, it's very important to um, connect multi, in a multidisciplinary way. Now the ICRISAT data is longitudinal. It follows the same set of households over 2010 to 14 for 30 villages across eight states. And then one state split into two, so it's nine states and a few states also for 2009. Now what we did with this was, is to do two things, not just look at intergender gaps, which is the gaps between men and women and track changes over time, but we also examined intragender differences. Apropos my comment earlier, uh, who gets the land? Is it daughters? Is it widows? Uh, and it makes a big difference who does. And this is in this paper, um, 2021 paper in the Journal of Development Studies. Now, the second um, thing we did was that, you know, inequality and gender gaps can be measured in multiple ways. Uh, and um, often we might be, we are often not necessarily talking about the same thing. And so it's very important to clarify what are the indicators you're using and indicators mean different things. So we use seven indicators here um, to assess uh, the gender gap. Now the first indicator, for instance, um, uh, percent of households with female landowners, um, uh, basically it's important because a household with even one landowner reflects a shift away uh, from social norms um, of solely male ownership. Uh, and it acquaints communities with the idea that women can own and manage land. The second indicator gives us the gap between male and female landowners. 
So for instance, if, if we have gender equal inheritance laws were fully implemented um, and there was no bias in access via markets and government, we would expect the same proportions um, of men and women uh, to be owning land. The third uh, measures intragender differences because not all women in a landed household need own land. So which women own land? And the fourth is that you can own plots individually, but you can also own plots um, uh, jointly. It could be with a sibling, a female sibling, a male sibling, with, with your spouse, and so on. So we need information on both uh, individual and joint ownership. And then what percent of household land is owned by gender? What is the average area owned? What is the quality of land owned? So all these indicators are important. We measured all of this, and this graph gives you five of those indicators. So you find that gender inequality is high um, by all the indicators, uh, with the figures for women being less than 20% by all indicators. So barely 16% of landowning households have any female landowners, and just 8.4% of women own land. In, in, across these nine states among rural landowning households. Overall, women constituted only 14% of landowners owning, owning only 11% of the land. Now, um, the, so, so we can see this broadly gives you, by all the indicators, uh, the inequalities. Now, India is a big country, and I had uh, hinted to you that regions matter. So if you look at regions, if you take just 2014, and we've divided it up into four um, uh, regions, um, the, um, uh, the South, North, West, and East, and then three regions, and then all the regions. And what is clear is, if you take all the regions, that uh, you can see the um, average inequalities, but also what is important is that in the South, the figures are better. So for instance, in, in, in the Southern states, you by, by the first indicator, you have 29% um, of households where a woman owns land. Um, and uh, female landowners versus male landowners, 23% are female landowners of the total landowners and so on. Um, so uh, whereas here, so if you take the first indicator, it's 29 in the South, 10.5 in West and Central, and 12 in Eastern India. And then um, let's look at changes over time. So we, if you look at from 2009, 2014, you find that actually there's very little shift. So all the South performs better uh, in 2009-10, and it, there's marginal improvement. Um, if you take all regions together, you see that there's hardly any change. Now, um, what uh, does stand out is this state was split, Andhra Pradesh was split into two, is Andhra Pradesh. And this is important um, because it's a bit of an outlier even in South India, uh, and it's attributable particularly to the chief minister's policies uh, during um, 83 to 95 when he was re-elected three times. Uh, and he was particularly had a number of pro-women policies in relation to a land, both in terms of laws and in terms of administrative policies. Uh, this was the region you visited, Ruth, when you came, and DDS is, um, was the scheme, one of the schemes that the chief minister had started of loan come grant for Dalit women. Now, I might mention that most studies actually only have two indicators, and so having number of indicators is helpful. Now, um, I, we also then did um, logistical regressions. I won't give you a lot of tables. You can easily refer to them. But what we found was that if you look at the intergender gap between men and women, to assess the likelihood of women owning land vis-a-vis -vis men and vis-a-vis -vis other women, uh, for intergender, the probability of men owning land was 48 percentage points greater than of women owning land, if you control for a range of other things. But the intragender, sorry, there's a typo here. Intragender results are very interesting because the probability of widows owning land was 22 percentage points greater than other women. 
For both genders, older people were more likely to own land, but not necessarily the most educated. Now, this appears to reflect the fact that younger educated members of rural households don't want to farm. And they are therefore seen as having less claims. Now, this issue of widows versus daughters goes back a long way. Now, widowhood remains central to becoming landowners despite legal changes favoring daughters. Most female owners acquired the land in our study through marital families rather than parental families. And despite all the effort I and others had put in for amending the 2005 law, um, we found, find on the ground that the figures don't indicate the law has been that much implemented because we would have expected an increasing percentage of daughter to have acquired or co-owned land with their families. Historically, 11th, 12th century, I might remind you, the order of heirs was four generations of men, men in the male line of descent, then the widow, then the unmarried daughter and the married daughter. So, so this, it's, it's almost as if we, we have that picture. Now, getting no land or receiving land mostly as aging widows means that most Indian women lack landed assets at a time in their life cycle when ownership would benefit them and their families the most. And if you remember, the empirical evidence was that if the mother owns assets, it benefits children's education, health, and nutrition. So how would those benefits come about if they actually don't get to own the land until they are? Uh, past reproductive age, for instance. So why do so few daughters inherit? One, few, one major factor is social norms of marriage and seclusion. So I've taken these maps, which actually go back to my field of one's own. These were um, created uh, by looking at dozens and dozens of ethnographies. Um, and um, I found them as an economist delving into them was absolutely important and, and uh, fascinating. And here, the, uh, chosen these maps, as you can see, village endogamy simply means everything that's green is good in the map. Uh, and um, yeah, village endogamy means that you are allowed to marry within the village. Um, and, and so these are South Asia maps. Uh, as you can, this is Pakistan, Nepal, um, yeah, this is um, East India, Bangladesh, and then South India and Sri Lanka. And um, this region, the white region is where you're forbidden to marry within the village. Um, you're also forbidden to marry within the extended family. Close kin marriage norms are completely forbidden. You can't actually marry anybody who's related to through your mother's side on five um, uh, generations, you know, more than generations. There are certain other concepts. Um, and uh, so you can't, whereas in South India, Sri Lanka, for instance, you are allowed to marry uh, within the extended kin, as it has been in Europe. Um, for instance, and, uh, and, and you can also marry within the village. Then there are female seclusion norms, which are also very interestingly north-south. Uh, by female seclusion, it doesn't necessarily mean parda. Here is a picture I've given of what it means in Rajasthan, which is northwest India, the state I come from, where the women cover, the, these are Hindu women, by the way, so it's not just Muslim parda. And female seclusion, as we know, means that it's not just, even if you don't have the veil, spaces are gender segregated. So if you're a woman in Northwest India, you're a young woman, you're a woman farmer, um, you can't simply go to the tea shop and say, look, I need two people to help me out do the harvest. Uh, it, it, it really restricts you in operating on your own in input uh, and labor markets. Uh, so there are um, problems there. So these, these social norms matter and these lead to regional patterns of the degree to which there's resistance to women having rights in land. But something else matters, which is um, even more subtle, I might say, which is the social legitimacy of claims. Now, there are diverse notions about who should inherit property. And we all have notions about that. If any of you written a will, um, you might want to give it to your favorite canary, I mean, like, or, or whatever. But um, there are serious aspects uh, traditionally of who has the legitimate right to inherit. It could be the person who performs your last rites in Hindu, uh, within uh, Hindus, usually it's the sons. Blood ties are very important globally in most systems, but they're not equal. All, all blood relatives are not seen as equal. 
Marital ties are seen as important, and hence widows over daughters. Proximity of residents who look after me in old age can matter. And then I put in this additional one, which is who wants to farm. And we see this playing out today uh, in many countries. I just visit, recently visited Ireland and you have one child who wants to farm, typically male who gets the farm. So social legitimacy of claims matter. Now, what all this leads to is inequalities in, in uh, the gender gap in ownership. So expanding beyond India, I am sharing with you a slide which looks at various South Asian countries and then evidence from Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Um, and uh, as you can see in nowhere do you find that it is, um, uh, that you, you can see there's a huge gap in all countries. In South Asia, except Sri Lanka, which has a substantial bilateral inheritance system, um, you have um, the percent, you have landless men also, but a large proportion of men and uh, of women are landless, larger proportion of women are landless. And then percent landowners who are, who are women, um, as you can see, there are um, huge gender differences, even in sub-Saharan Africa. This is work that uh, Cheryl Doss and others have done. Um, I've given you the um, references here. And then in Latin America, especially Carmen Diana Dior and Magdalena de Leon's work, where they've looked at five countries. So as you can see, the, the figures, this is the largest figure, but the figures don't go beyond a quarter to a third. And then I took the liberty of putting uh, together a slide um, from what I could cull uh, for South Africa, um, based on some of the information that uh, Ruth had sent me, uh, but then I collated it and I hope I've got it right. So here, um, what I could find is that this is gender gap in land owned and distributed. So the land audit report of 2017, if you take individual owners, you get figures like 52% of the owners are men, 34% women and 14% are other. If you take the area in terms of hectares of farmland and agricultural land, you have even a bigger gap, 71% male, 13% female. You do have 13% uh, which are co-owned male, female, which some of which could be added on to this 13% of female to make the figure slightly higher. But even if you add both, it get 26, it still is a huge gender gap. In the land distribution program, I know South Africa has had many uh, different programs. Ruth has mentioned it in the, in, in the beginning of this seminar. Um, and uh, it, between 2009 to 18, uh, the land distribution program, they're fought, overall 41% of the beneficiaries were female. But this, there was a staggered effect. So it was most effective in 2009 and 10, where more than half can imagine the beneficiaries were women, although we don't know how much land they got. And then it tailed, it, it, it sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, tails off. So 20, by the time you come, it's, it, it decreases in 2013, only 1% of the beneficiaries were women. So it's in, it would be interesting to ask, why is it tailing off? Um, what was it in 2009-10 at the beginning, which led to this huge um, you know, positive effect for women, and then it tailed off. And then there's been an interesting policy of land lease and disposal policy, where again, you find that there is female, the only 20.5% um, of, uh, of women have got it. And um, there are obviously constraints because in order to uh, take advantage of this policy, you need to show that you have basic farming skills or you're willing to acquire those skills. I wouldn't imagine that women would have a problem with that, but obviously it depends on what standards of skills you put in. Uh, and also there is this issue of collectives that men, 50% of what, what men got were, uh, were um, individual, uh, whereas most of what women got were collectives. Now, whether this is a negative or positive thing is something I'd like to hear more about. So if women own land, um, how do they use it um, is also important because you want land in order to, be, to have a sustainable livelihood. Now, global evidence, I've already mentioned the gender differences uh, in land use and productivity, but the number of studies are very sparse. Most of them are sub in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And this evidence shows in some cases, uh, women farmers, um, be they managers or owners, have higher productivity than, productivity than male farmers. In some studies, they show um, they have the same yields and some have lower. Now in India, this very recent paper, which was published earlier this year, ours is only the second study for Asia um, on the impact of women owning land in its use, uh, on its use and productivity, and the first one for India. And as we know, we've, there's been lots of arguments about ownership conferring tenure security, which can enhance access to credit, to extension subsidies, and investment in land. Now, our results for India showed that women landowners were more likely to lease out their land than men. So in, this, in our results, we found 31% of women owners relative to only 8% of male owners leased out their land. And the probability of women lease self-cultivating was much less than for men. And this is particularly because of a, uh, a shortage of family labor. Now, uh, getting old was a factor in both genders in, in leasing out. And, but once you take the owners who actually self-cultivate, we didn't find any significant gender differences in the in annual value of output per hectare, with or without controlling for other matters. What did matter was caste. So scheduled caste faced a substantial disadvantage with significantly low productivity there among owner cultivators of both sexes. And this has to do with structural disadvantages in access to inputs and so on. And we could substitute race for it or, or something else. So then we come to some key, uh, the last part of my talk, how do you enhance women's land access? One is about implementing the law. And I think uh, many reports in across globally have talked about it, is firstly raise the awareness of laws among citizens, lawyers, legal advisors, and NGOs. You'll be surprised to note that I put in uh, legal advisors and lawyers because you find that, um, you know, inheritance law is not the most popular subject taught in law schools, I discovered. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, it's important uh, to actually discuss that. And then of course, among village officials who handle land records, who register if somebody dies, who gets what share. Then legal aid and support, many governments do. I know there is legal aid in South Africa, there is in India, but do women know about these schemes? Are they able to negotiate, you know, go through the documents, do they understand? And women need social support because it's not popular if you file your claim because your family is going to resist it. So I had these, I put down these ideas, which by the way, haven't been tried, but you know, I had suggested once to the government that you can use mobile vans to visit communities and provide information on laws and legal aid. And you can disseminate uh, material in different languages like once a month um, if mobile vans went. So it's something to think about. And then of course, there are issues of social norms and social perceptions, which have to be tackled. Um, ideas about that it's only brothers who provide economic security to women or that women are economic burdens or they don't need to work their wives rather than farmers. So if we are not doing so well vis-a-vis -vis negotiating with families and in India, for instance, 86% of agricultural land is privately owned. Are there other means? Now the state, we look at the state, but the state doesn't have huge amounts of surplus land to, 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 um, uh, to distribute. Um, and uh, certainly uh, in, in India and in some other countries, you find that now titles are given to poor women or their joint titles. But I want to talk a little bit about markets um, with state support. So here is an example where in that one state, I said Andhra Pradesh, where the chief minister had, um, was women friendly and they had started a loan come grant scheme to help groups of dis caste disadvantaged women to buy land. And so for instance, if you're 10 women, you, have, you buy 10, 10 acres and you divide it up one acre each, and then uh, you uh, can cultivate it either individually or together. The second is to enable land leasing. The important thing here is that I want to emphasize is that the group approach can help women farmers both access land and overcome production constraints rather than individual approaches. And I particularly talked about talk about group farming in the past many years I've been working on this. Now, potentially one can say, well, there are many advantages if, if small farmers um, with one or two hectares actually 
about 86% of farmers across 111 countries cultivate less than two hectares. So um, if you pull the land, uh, there'll be more economies of scale, there's greater access to land, you'll save on hired labor, you could get better access to credit inputs and technical information, you have a greater diversity of skills and leadership talents, and you can experiment with riskier, higher value crops with higher payoffs, which you can't do if you're individually farming. Um, you could spread risk among a, large, among a larger number. If you contract out, um, contract in, you're better able to deliver if you're a group than if you're individuals. And we all know that groups are better and have more bargaining power with governments, with markets. And climate change has to be factored in because climate change is going to make huge differences, already is in terms of yields for smallholders, both in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, but importantly for women, where they're, especially where social norms are not, uh, uh, not women friendly, there are less res restrictions if they go as a group on public inter interaction, they have more autonomy in management. Now you'll say, well, yes, all this is very interesting and good if you're potentially, what about practice? So I have some good news. So uh, Kerala um, is an uh, important example. Um, in the 2000s, under its poverty alleviation program, the government of Kerala promoted boot group farming. And uh, what, it ha what happens is you have neighborhood groups and you have, um, uh, they do savings and credit. And those who are able to do savings and credit for six months can apply for loans without collateral to the uh, National Bank uh, for Agriculture. And what they're also doing is they're pooling their land, labor, and capital. They lease in land, um, and they share costs and benefits. Today, there are 68, over 68,000 all-women groups in Kerala with more than 300,000 women. So I did a very intensive uh, study looking at productivity and profits of group and individual farms over an entire year with weekly data. And we find here that the annual value of output of group farms was 1.8 times that of individual farms. Banana, which is a major uh, item uh, grown in Kerala, the yields again were, the banana yields were 1.6 times more than the individual farms. And then the net returns per farm were five times more in individual farms, in group farms, sorry, relative individual farms. So by all counts, the group farms did much better than individual farms uh, economically. There are examples of group farming, some partly um, the work I, I did, uh, it led to some experiments in Eastern India. And again, um, uh, I looked at that along with the people who initiated this experiment, and we found that it is economically much more efficient. And there's some examples in West India. Importantly, in crisis management in both Kerala and in the Eastern and Western India, the group farms did much better economically than individual family farmings in terms of food security and in terms of being able to survive through COVID lockdowns. So is this only in South Asia? No, here are examples in Europe. The most important is France. France today has 91,000 group farms. Um, there's some in Norway, some in Romania. So these are studies across Europe. Um, you'd be interesting to, interested to know that in the European Union also, 43% of um, farmers uh, cultivate less than two hectares. So that is important. Now, there are certain principles which are important if you're talking about group farming, because this is not the old top-down socialist collectivization. Um, they need to be voluntary. Uh, the small group size, five to seven to eight, 10, maximum 10, I would imagine, um, uh, is, is the number. Economic homogeneity, but social heterogeneity, and I can come back to that in Q&A. Participative decision-making, checks on free riding, which is that you know, if, if your four people are working together, one person doesn't turn up work, you have to have mechanisms of holding them to account. And then fair and transparent distribution of production costs and benefits. And then if you want to scale it up, then there are ways of scaling it up. So you can have a range of group farms in a village and you can form a federation. So I'll conclude um, that women across many countries have been struggling for land rights for decades, and this has led to equality in law. But, um, there, but in terms of 
understanding what is there in practice. There is serious uh, data scarcity um, and uh, in terms of nationally representative data. And where it does exist, we know that there are huge inequalities in land um, in, 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 in actual practice of uh, by gender. And um, so if you want to enhance land access, we need solutions which combine state support for market access rather than simply dependent on families, which are obstructed by social norms. We also need solutions for very small economically non-viable farms. So it's not just a question of getting a bit of land, but how productive, how profitable it is. If, you're, if you know, women and men are going to actually put in a lot of their labor, then they have to be profitable. And so um, I feel group approaches to accessing and cultivating land could be a way forward. India's experience uh, shows that group farms, especially all women farms, can increase women's land access and productivity and empower them. And you have two, at least two diff different models and multiple models. The Indian model could be looked at for very small holders and the French model for medium-sized farms. And then I would make a pitch again for monitoring women, uh, land access. So these are number of, so I, I'm going to leave you now with a number of questions for South Africa. Are there inequalities in inheritance laws? Do the laws differ for agricultural land versus other kinds of property? In practice, what is the gender gap in land owned by region and ethnicity race? You know, the figures I, I had found were for all of South Africa. Are there data, data gaps in, in assessing three? And how much awareness is there of the law among women, their families, and local administration? What forms of legal aid and NGO support can women receive? To what extent are social norms and perception barriers about what can be done about them? Uh, and I, I, I grant that you, know, you don't have some of the kinds of barriers that you saw in South Asia and in, in South Africa. I mean, further norms won't exist, but there could be other barriers. And then I'd be very interested in knowing what are the prospects of promoting group farming in South Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa more generally. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bina. I can give you a virtual round of applause for the lecture. <laughs>